I have the opportunity to introduce Maria Gaspar, an artist that I have long admired. She is an interdisciplinary artist who negotiates the politics of location through installation, sculpture, sound, and performance. Gaspar's work addresses the issues of spatial justice in order to amplify, mobilize, or divert structures of power through individual and collective gestures. Her work spans formats, durations, including sound performances at a military site in New Haven, long-term art public interviews at the largest jail in the country, which happens to be in our very own backyard, appropriations of museum archives, and audiovisual works documenting a jail located in her childhood neighborhood. Gaspar has exhibited at venues including the MCA in Chicago, Jack Shaman Gallery in New York, Art Space in New Haven, Connecticut, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, amongst many others. Her work on the injustices of incarceration is receiving international recognitions with the recent grants awarded for the Art for Social Justice Fund established by philanthropist Agnes Gunn and the Art Matters Foundation, which recognizes artists whose work breaks ground socially and aesthetically. Gaspar is the recipient of an Imagining Justice Art Grant, a Robert Rauschenberg Artists' Activist Fellowship, an Art Matters Grant, a Creative Capital Award, a Joan Mitchell Emerging Artist Grant, a Sorana Women of the Art Award Achievement, Art Activism from the National Museum of Mexican Art, and a Chamberlain Award for Social Practice at the Headland Center for the Arts. That's a lot. Gaspar was named Chicagoan of the Year in arts in 19, excuse me, in 2014 by art critic and historian Lori Waxman. She is an assistant professor at the Art Institute of Chicago and holds an MFA in studio arts from the University of Illinois at Chicago and a BFA from Pratt Institute in Brooklyn in New York. It is for these reasons that Maria Gaspar is our inaugurary collective impact artist. Please join me in welcoming Maria Gaspar. Hi, good evening. How are you doing? Good. Okay. So nice to be here. Thank you uh, for inviting me. Thank you to the faculty for letting me be part of this amazing lecture series. So um, when I was talking to Amy about preparing the talk, it asked me to talk a little bit about my development as an artist, talk about some of the issues or themes that have emerged through my practice. So I decided to start with some kind of an overview of my work, but also tell you a little bit about my own upbringing in Chicago, on Chicago's west side, growing up in La Villita, and how growing up in that neighborhood really impacted my work as an artist and also as an educator and sometimes as an organizer. So as Amy mentioned, in my work I address issues of spatial justice. I'm really interested in power dynamics in ways in which artists or cultural producers can mediate spaces of power and deal with them through individual or collective gestures. So my projects have historically taken place at different kinds of spaces, from museums and galleries to spaces like Cook County Jail. This is a, a, a photograph that we took in front of Cook County Jail on Chicago's west side. I'm interested also in kind of community public memory of, of different neighborhoods. This is a piece done at the Franklin and East Garfield Park several years ago. But I also am interested in performance and sound and the politics of the body as well. And so I often work with performers, often choreographing pieces with others, either artists or non-artists, to develop works that examine the body and the, the specific play, uh, location. I've also worked with youth, so I have a background in working with young people for many years, and so I'm also really interested in engaging with folks who may or may not have a particular kind of experience and thinking about ways in which we can collectively produce work together and generate what I like to call as liberatory actions. Some of my larger scaled projects really require a lot of time, so one project that I'll talk a lot about is 96 Acres Project, which takes place at Cook County, but I've also developed projects outside of Chicago, including this one called Sounds for Liberation in New Haven, Connecticut, where I work collaboratively with the New Haven Correctional Center as well as 
a local neighborhood to develop a sound installation piece with many of the communities on sort of both sides of the wall. So I'm going to, I always bring my mother with me. So here she is. I often bring her up because she was a huge inspiration to me growing up because she was an artist and she was somebody who didn't necessarily have training but you know would do these sort of wacky things. She was a clown for many years which is her picture on the left and she was also a radio disc jockey at a boys and girls club called WCYC radio station. So I spent a lot of time with her at the radio station listening to her broadcasts. I think of her as one of the sort of most incredible kind of community-based artists because she was able to identify a set of needs in our neighborhood of Little Village on the west side where you have mostly Spanish-speaking residents in an you know, 80,000 resident kind of populated neighborhood, yet there were hardly any kind of media opportunities for folks to engage in. So she produced two shows. One was a, a really kind of romantic poetry, a little too sexy for me because I was like five years old listening to her talk about poetry and in a very romantic voice. And then the other show was a health show for Latina women. So, you know, she was able to identify these kind of missing links and produce content to then bring to the community. I was also a mini clown, so I often went with her to her gigs, mostly birthday parties and, you know, community folks' backyards, and we would, you know, do performances and things like this. So I think a lot about how audio and performance continues to have an emergence in my work. I think, you know, it's sort of interesting to think about art as a sort of social force that through kind of joy and love in a community practice, one can really create these exciting kind of radical and even really wacky experiences. And, you know, another large part of my kind of practice comes from being a muralist. So I started off making art when I was about 14 years old and creating murals with local artists. So this is a piece here by Hector Duarte, who I worked for for several years. You may have seen his piece, which is located in Pilsen. And, you know, I started to really think about the ways in which the mural movement, especially one so significant, like the one in Chicago, kind of helped think about the public monument and the ways in which community artists or organizers were able to turn often kind of banal walls or uh, spaces into really powerful forms of public art. And not only that, but also to think about that transformation, to think about the ways in which one can turn a seemingly average building into something that has meaning and power and significance for a group of people. The Wall of Respect is one that I've never seen you know, live. It, was produced on the south side of Chicago, and it, it sort of lives in my aesthetic and political imagination. And it was really a trailblazer to think about the ways in which neighborhoods can create their own narratives, that you know, it wasn't dependent on outsiders to sort of come in and, and create those narratives for them. So I think a lot about those qualities in which resilience and thriving is a big part of an aesthetic practice and the ways in which artists have kind of superseded those things. So, you know, I, I also like to look at the way that city infrastructure works. In Chicago, you may have seen the graffiti blaster program that removes graffiti by blasting these unpermissioned local codes and messages by browning out graffiti. And um, I'm not, you know, I, I'm thinking that the brown outs sort of have a connection to the architecture of Chicago, the ways in which so much architecture is made in, in brown brick. So that's the decision why, you know, the city uses brown. But I started to look at the ways in which these graffiti blasters are both revealing and concealing these spaces by blasting things brown. And so early on, I became really fascinated by the way that the color brown would eventually become a tapestry across an entire neighborhood. And I thought of them also like as blackouts, but instead brownouts. And I thought of them as this sort of political action. What if a whole neighborhood was, was browned out? 
So for a while, I was experimenting with those brownouts and creating these amorphous forms. And I was looking at the, the site, looking at the architecture and the interior of these spaces and creating these relationships between being seen and unseen. What does brown look like in a very white space? And so some of the brownouts became kind of creature-like or maybe giving a kind of nod to the body. There's a piece that inflates and deflates every five minutes through a timer that set off inside of the sculpture. And because I've been always really interested in the unfixed or the evolving, created this work where I invited performers to, to, in, to sort of interact with the sculpture in a sort of choreography. And so I invited students of mine, friends who were performers, but also non-performers to participate in this work. And, you know, if you've ever been to the MCA in Chicago for one of those First Fridays events, you probably have experienced a kind of like club-like atmosphere. So when I was invited to do this work, I was interested in kind of interrogating that and creating a performance that would sort of resist that, that spectacle. So here's a little clip of that performance. attempting to test the museum's boundaries by circumventing the pace and speed that made up the conditions of that evening. And on the other end of the city, I was also interested in exploring an institution that has been really close to me, which is the National Museum of Mexican Art. I am a first-generation Mexican-American person who grew up on the west side of Chicago, and so a large part of my upbringing you know, also meant going to the museum often especially one that was just a few blocks away from my house. So I was invited to produce a show there and became really interested in the cultural narratives and preservation practices of the museum. And I was looking for something. I was sort of searching through the archives, looking for material that I can work with. And I ended up looking at a category of their permanent collection called ephemera. And I became interested in ephemera because I was thinking very much about that unfixed, a kind of unstable identity, ways in which that Mexicanness or brownness can kind of change and evolve over time. I didn't want something that was fixed. So I started to look at some of their catalog cards and translate them either through ceramic pieces that I then displayed onto these uh, Mexican kind of furniture designs, and then also wove by hand these postcard images of representations of Mexico and Mexicans, and then juxtapose them with images of my own family. So if you look closely at the top, you can see a part of an image of my parents when they had arrived from Mexico to Chicago in the early 1960s in front of Fountain and Grant Park. And I was looking at the work of Gloria Saldúa, you know, queer Latina theorist who would often talk about the Nepantla, an in-betweenness, a third possibility, a hybrid self, or a new kind of future. So these collections that I was dealing with were kind of mashed up, collaged together, and then produced as a set of translucent screens. And as I like to do, I invited local residents to participate in the work. So I gave each, each of the six performers a catalog card of the ephemera collection and then they were asked to create facto fictional narratives based on that image or that object. Some of them talked about border control, others proposed Chicano futurist ideas, and the audience, as they entered, were unsure about what was truth or fiction, resulting in a kind of ambiguity. This is a little excerpt of that work. Brown matter is composed of historical traumas, and it continues to act on our existence today. The ghosts of our ancestors are what compose brown matter. Now, not everybody has to deal with the weight of brown matter. Brown bodies in particular must contend with brown matter on a daily basis, and the weight can often be overwhelming. Welcome to Brown Brilliance, Darkness Matter. My name is Jean and I will... So there's a, a 
also a lot of not knowing. You know, I gave these residents of the neighborhood who were also friends of mine a set of directions, and I didn't quite know what they were going to come up with. But that's also part of the experience that I was looking to have is sort of not knowing and allowing for each of those performers to contribute something that was meaningful to them. And that often would relate to a lot of the audience members that were coming in and experiencing the work. And so in the meantime, my own solo investigations continue to correspond to these historical landscapes. This is located on 16th Street in Chicago in Pilsen, where I was kind of inserting my own body into some of the historical murals. I was enacting a series of positions and gestures from restoring the images of the indigenous man with my body or making a brown suit made of brown plastic cloth and sort of inserting myself into it. And then I took those actions to a place like Iceland to study the color brown during the midnight sun. My brown suit became a kind of shelter or shield. And I was thinking of blending and blurring my body inside a mostly homogenous country. And I appeared and disappeared and like to think of them as these shape-shifting images. So I've been continuing this project over time. This is a more recent image on the hills of Sausalito during a residency that I did last year. I made this dry grasses suit that was hand-sewn and kind of staged a series of actions that tested my opacity. And I was looking at the work of Simone Brown, who wrote Dark Matters on the Surveillance of Blackness, who talks a lot about dark surveillance as a kind of tactic to resist surveillance. She describes it as a way to situate the tactics employed to render oneself out of sight. And she goes on to describe freedom practices that plot imaginaries that are oppositional and that are hopeful for another way of being. And so after delving into those modes of being seen and unseen, I decided to develop a work further by taking those ideas and, and specifically working in my childhood neighborhood where I've been working for over 15 years now and working with a group of young people. So I developed a project called City as Sight in 2010. And this is a moment where I sort of break, I, I break apart from doing the mural work. I had been doing larger scale mural work. I was doing a commission for the city and it started to feel as if the work was becoming more sort of decorative and it was sort of losing its kind of political power and I felt like I needed to make a pivot or a change. And I was really thinking about ways in which I could bring both an interest in performance and installation and bridge it with my public art practice. So City of Sight was one of those first projects that helped me kind of sort that out. So I worked with youth from two neighboring uh, communities, North Lawndale and South Lawndale, mostly a, a black and Mexican immigrant or first generation youth community. And for six weeks, we used the landscape of the city to generate events. We experimented with sound sculptures made of found materials, produced solar powered Arduinos, worked with field recordings, put objects out into the world to create these interactive moments for the public. We were also highly influenced by the work of artists like Valley Export. Here, this is Rebecca, who created shapes with her body and made these formal relationships with the city signage. Kevin placed his body into a gate between a private home and the street. And that by placing their bodies into the geometries and shapes of the city, they made their own kinds of narratives and even physically contended with the racial lines at particular intersections across each neighborhood. And if you're from Chicago, you know the ways in which we're really good at separating communities through viaducts or trains or bridges or our own kind of racialized norms. And so we talked a lot about internalized maps informed by a feeling of place and safety, about belonging and disbelonging. We were often threatening to the public too. If you can imagine a group of 15 young Latino and black youth sort of walking together throughout a neighborhood doing sort of these strange art pieces, we were often questioned 
and asked what we were doing, or we were often venturing into spaces of the neighborhood that weren't really meant for us to be in. So we really had to contend with that, and we had to talk a lot about that disruption and what that meant, and also really think about safety. And so while I was walking around with the group of youth, we started to look at the architecture of our neighborhood. And one of the largest architectures of our neighborhood is the Cook County Jail. And so we started to sort of think about the ways in which the jail is both visible and visible at the same time, and how we see it and how we don't, and who can afford to look away, and our relationship to incarceration our relationship to law enforcement and the way that state violence uh, sort of trickles down and, and affects our lives. And through that process, I had also started doing some organizing work for a community organization in Little Village, developing something called the Quality of, of Life Plan for the Arts, and really thinking about the arts, our arts and sort of cultural practices of a neighborhood and how to develop those and make them thrive. Cook County Jail is located at 26th in California. It's 96 acres in size, which is the equivalent to 74 American football fields. It's a jail, not a prison. So a jail is a place where people go when they're awaiting trial. And a prison is where people go when they've been convicted of a crime and are serving time. But as you may already know, there's people awaiting trial at Cook County Jail for up to seven years. The jail has been located here since the late 19th century and has grown over many decades. It's the largest single site jail in the country. It holds now about 7,500 detainees every day. When I started the project in 2012, there were, more, there were about 13,000 people. There's approximately 5,000 people, staff, and volunteers that work at the jail. So, you know, part of my process as an artist is when I'm developing a project like this that isn't a short-term work, that it isn't a sort of drop-in project, but rather a long-term project is thinking about what my investment is going to be and thinking about what other people's investment might be. And so I started to really study it and research it and really try to inform and educate myself about Cook County Jail, but also about incarceration. So it's been a very long process for me, and it's been one that is continuously evolving and in, in, in which I'm learning from. Um, here's a view of the neighborhood from the perspective of one of the administration buildings. I'm not sure how uh, familiar you are with Michelle Alexander's book, The New Jim Crow. She calls incarceration modern day slavery. And so when you look at the larger systems at play, there's no denying it. This is a good example. The research project called Million Dollar Blocks was created a few years ago, and it was looking at the state of Illinois. You see that there are five neighborhoods that all are in Chicago for which the majority of incarcerated people come from, predominantly low-income communities, black communities, Latino communities. And so they're making the case that if we were to spend $550 million not to incarcerate people from the Austin neighborhood, but rather to provide good quality public education or employment, we would see those numbers of incarceration drop. So they're, they're doing this in various cities to really get people to think differently about the role of incarceration within our communities and our country. We know that you know, in the US we incarcerate about two and a half million people, the most than any other country in the world. So my first visit to the jail was uh, as a kid through a Scared Straight program in the early 90s. Scared Straight was developed in the 70s in the United States. And sometimes, I'm not sure if anybody was uh, experienced that before, but they like to take you know, young people to like um, military sites or have law enforcement folks talk, talk to you and scare you straight. And then I grew up a few blocks away, so it was part of my landscape. And I recall when I was a kid and, and visiting the jail that I was walking through Division I, which is the oldest part of the jail now closed, and I was seeing the faces of people that resembled my family and my friends or my neighbors. And I started to 
study how a place of incarceration kind of coexists with the neighborhood of 80,000 residents. In which direction are people looking? So this image is real. It looks like it's Photoshop, but it's a real event that takes place every summer that's organized by a local chamber of commerce. Here's an image of the Mexican Independence Day Parade, which usually sets up their floats around the sort of oldest part of the jail, where you'll see the cowboys and the cowgirls come and set up. Sometimes, in the past, you could hear the exchange between currently detained inside of Division I, inside those buildings, and then people parading. And so partly what I was looking at is uh, not only photographing the space through the bus or through from another perspective like the, the administration building, but also looking at Google Earth images and how difficult it is for Google Earth to render this architecture. Instead, you see that it, you know, it's comprised of voids and porosities. So I was taking this sort of Google tour and moving around the jail, and whenever I found an interesting image, I would screenshot it and turn it into a print. I've spent a lot of time at the wall, both symbolically and, and physically doing projects, and so I've started to develop a series of works that attempt to embody the space through sound installation or video projection. Here's a slow pan, uh, which is a video installation that I've been working on, and it includes audio from inside of the jail during a visit I did, and then the carnival. So I, I really wanted the viewer to contend with the site that often, you know, we think about places of incarceration. If we don't, if we don't think we have a kind of direct link to a place of incarceration, it's usually out of, out of mind or out of sight, out of mind. And I really wanted it to be confronted by the viewer. So over time and doing these studies and thinking about the site and, and spending a lot of time in the neighborhood doing artistic projects and community building, I started to lay the foundation for what would become the 96 Acres Project. So this is in 2012. The project began through a community building process. We developed a kind of vision statement or a set of goals for the project early on. It identified a set of issues to create a kind of vision or collective vision for the project, which included an artistic work that would be site responsive, that would talk about the impact of the jail through these counter narratives, and that would be relevant to the most affected communities. So people that were, you know, maybe family members of those who are incarcerated or people who are incarcerated, and, and anybody else who really has dealt with systemic oppression. Because as we know, all of these things are, are systemic and based on these racialized ways that that you know, we, we exist in in society. The methods that we started to use more focused on kind of action-based ephemeral projects that would contend with the fixed qualities of a place like a jail. And so over time, we started to kind of mobilize a lot of different kinds of people, I became interested in the project. So folks like journalists or just that cared about the issue, poets, educators, high school teachers, to architects and, and many others that started to contribute and become part of the work. Now anybody that does kind of community engaged work knows that no community is monolithic. That, you know, uh, the community is not a sort of neutral uh, space. You know, it's highly political, it's highly complex, and part of the community conversation that emerged included a whole number of issues and and thinking about aesthetics and beauty and the way that we each valued art and what we thought you know, art is. And we had to sort of contend with that as a group and, and, and discuss it. But also the way that the, the art and social justice work could also talk about things like the prison industrial complex. You know, what are these opportunities that 
that we have as artists to, to kind of get people to think and to question and critique the, the very institution itself. So this is one meeting, for example, that, that we held when we had a show at Gallery 400 a couple years ago. And so over time, we ended up presenting a series of live works we were able to get funding from several local and national funders to then produce a set of actions and site interventions at and around the jail site. We organized an open call. I organized a community panel. And, and through that process, we ended up identifying a series of projects that we wanted to see happen. The project you know, required a significant amount of civic engagement where my role often was a kind of mediator between a group of stakeholders. You know, I am an artist and I've worked with all kinds of people from Cook County Board President to a local commissioner to the executive director of a jail. That's sort of work, what the work required is to kind of move through these different kinds of spaces. So I'm, I'm always interested in how an artistic project could develop these new kinds of partnerships and collaborations with sometimes unlikely players that might develop into something unexpected and something new. And that each of, each of us had different expectations about the role of art and artists and we had to kind of work through that and talk about it. So I'm going to show you a couple of the projects that we ended up working on, including one, one by Yolo Kali Arts Reach where we asked young people to produce a public art piece. And so they were interested in creating a text-based work where they could question the, the viewer that's sort of walking around the jail. And so they generated a bunch of stencils that were then power washed onto the jail wall, sort of removing dirt to then let the sort of text show. So here's a little clip of that. And that plays more with what does it mean to have a jail in the community and what does it mean to see the jail throughout the neighborhood? I think it's getting people to think about it like uh, the jail's here, it's my backyard, but like doing this is like, you know, it sort of gets your thoughts like, yo, yeah, why do we have a jail like right here? And, and this community and like that makes so much money has something like this here, you know? And we don't have a museum. We use the pressure washer in the neighborhood usually to remove graffiti. And this is interesting because this is like reverse graffiti. So I really love this idea to use it to put a positive message just by cleaning. Seeing like, oh, today's your day. It might just change your thought on something that just happened or something like an argument you might have had with a loved one in there. When you look at the jail, you see people, but you don't see them as a person, person. You see them as someone that did something bad, someone that's just bad to society and deserve to be the place they are. But Sometimes things that people don't really do bad things to be in there. So I, I like that, that last statement. This young woman who did the project was also understanding that, you know, that the jail doesn't necessarily, right, incarcerate people that, you know, actually did a crime. But instead it's a highly racialized system that really targets poor people and black and Latino communities. And so I think that moment is, it really exemplifies the kind of critique and engagement that we were trying to get to with the work. So, you know, the, the project started to begin to unfold these, these kinds of issues and ideas of, of, of the jail and talk about these inequities, but at the same time kind of imagine new possibilities. So we developed another project where we were interested in physicalizing data. So you know, you look at data and you think uh, maybe you're not really connected to that information because it feels really remote. But we wanted to look at the racial demographics of Cook County Jail and think about ways in which to physicalize that through public sound installation. So we looked at the racial demographics and we crowdsourced 100 cars based on those demographics. So for example, at the time when we did this, 67% of people incarcerated at Cook County Jail were black, 19 Latino, and the rest white. So we crowdsourced 67 black cars, 19 brown cars, etc., and then stationed them on the residential side of sort of the west part of Cook County Jail. So they were stationed right in between a local block 
and the jail. It was one of the most ambitious projects and it was one of the most ethereal ones, but we had to, one, uh, kind of uh, get the trust of the block and so we identified the local block leader and then worked with neighbors to make sure that, one, they were okay with the project, they understood it, they were interested in it, and that, uh, two, they felt safe and they felt like it was something that they wanted to be a part of. You know, you just see a black car after black car after black car. It's stark, but not surprising. And just being that I have a white car, I thought it would be something cool to be a part of. Apparently we had too many white cars, and so your car could be part of the event, so what do you think about that? I think it's messed up, really. I'm not sure how else to say it. But too often we think about people as numbers, and sometimes it's just a little more striking to see it visually. I mean, I think all of us value the, the importance and the significance of this project in attempting to change the, uh, the look into one that is much more inspiring uh, than it currently is. So the reason why you're hearing B.B. King in the background is we were looking at the kind of cultural shifts that have taken place in, in places like jails and prisons across the country in the span of 50 years. And B.B. King performed inside Cook County Jail. In fact, he has an album called Live at Cook County Jail in 1971. And he performed inside the yard of the jail. And people were able to invite their family members to attend the performance. At the time that B.B. King performed, the, the warden or executive director at the time was somebody who had a psychology background. And at the time of this project, the woman that you saw in purple there with the badge was the newest executive director of the jail. And she is someone who had you know, joined the sheriff's department who has a background in psychology and whose own father was in prison. And there was this hope that maybe there would be some kind of reform through her work. And so we were trying to kind of think about those differences or, or threads that we were seeing over the span of many decades. We know that after things like Pontiac, uprisings at Pontiac Prison, that things were taken away like cultural performances and maybe what some would consider more rehabilitation kind of practices. And so we wanted to talk about that in the work. So we partnered with Chicago Public Media where we live broadcasted that music and then we did a bunch of interviews and then broadcasted that through people's car radio. So they parked, they tuned into Vocalo Radio and then sort of pumped the volume up so that the sound can kind of move through their cars. One of the challenges with doing this kind of very public and community engaged work is to think about the problem of the museum exhibition. You know, how does the work then exist within maybe more kind of static space like the museum. But we had an opportunity to bring the collection of work to the Jane Addams Hall House Museum, which for us really represented this great space to talk about social justice and art. And that would get a lot of visibility, not just from local people, but also from an international audience. So we included video and audio documentation, some of which you saw here and, and many others that I'm not showing and then also curated and organized a bunch of workshops that were free. And so, for example, one of the workshops that we did was called the Panopticant, and it was a workshop between a local Chicago artist who runs her own project at Stateville Prison named Sarah Ross, as well as a local architect whose father was incarcerated, and so they teamed up to lead a workshop that talked about architecture and power. But we also didn't want to be overly didactic, and so we were trying to figure out a way to kind of house the, the, the work. So the fabric piece that you see is a print out of just the north facing wall of the county jail. Um, it was, you know, like uh, 850 photographs that were taken, high resolution. 
actually by Rachel Herman, who teaches here? Yes. So Rachel Herman was a great <laughs> friend and who was willing enough to take all of these photographs, which were then photoshopped and then printed onto fabric. And then it was placed onto a curtain track system so that we can move the wall. So maybe a prison abolitionist would come in and take the wall away where somebody else might want to put the wall up. Um, another instance where we engage in a museum space is the MCA. A couple years ago, we were asked to produce a project. And one of the things that we talked about is that we wanted to not show, again, static images or static work, but rather invite performers to come and, and produce work with their voices and with their body so that there was a kind of agency in the museum. So we worked with 25 performers and then took transcriptions from video, audio interviews that we were doing about how people were impacted by incarceration and then repeat them as a kind of sonic intervention at the MCA. And so here are images of some of the performers creating gestures and then also translating or transcribing that audio into the museum space. Two of the performers who are teachers, actually one, one of them is a social justice teacher in Little Village, was interested in performing as correctional officer. And he was sort of a cross between correctional officer and docent. And he sort of just moved around the space with his partner and just surveilled the museum goers. So here's a little clip of that. Black shoes. Low girls. A long sleeve turtleneck. I don't want to say this. But, but it's, it's kind, kind of ghetto. ghetto. During the performance, there are people performing as prison guards, right? And they're doing their job diligently. So you can definitely understand that they're prison guards. They're dressed like prison guards. It's intense. Well, I think it's very disarming at first. You know, like clearly somebody is entering your space in a, you know, unexpected and somewhat menacing <laughs> way. I think on a visceral level, you immediately respond to that. These are institutions that we're establishing to kind of have an impact on society, right? These are how ways that we're dealing with our societal issues and problems, and we should understand what those things are doing. And there's a lot of correlation between like prison design and museum design. Sometimes they're the same architect, but also the ways in which behavior is kind of controlled, right, in museums and also places of incarceration. So we were also thinking a lot about that as we were moving through the museum. So after spending about five years doing projects like these, mostly working with folks on the outside of the jail who were either formerly incarcerated or impacted by it, it made sense that the next part of the project really needed to take place inside of Cook County Jail. So the next project that I'll, that I'll talk about, that I'll end with, is called Radioactive Stories from Beyond the Wall, which just had its debut about a month ago now. And the project really focused on the power of sound and transmission in an, in an attempt to dissolve the wall. And so we talked a lot about how we can consider the jail wall as amplifier or as speaker and think of it as both a public art piece, but also a kind of broadcast. So myself and another co-instructor worked in two divisions throughout this fall and spring, where we generated drawings and also recorded audio with a group of men, and decided that we would develop a project with, that would then come to be a public art animation and live radio piece. And of course, I started to do research and think about what kind of radio history existed at Cook County Jail. You see programs in other places across the country, but at Cook County there's, I mean, it, you know, it's difficult to even bring in a recorder, so all of this really had to be negotiated with the jail and the sheriff's department. So we were thinking about the terms radio, activity, radiation, action, and started to sort of break apart 
that title of the work. And I started to think about the ways in which the atmosphere or the ways that, that, that the borders of that jail could then be kind of blurred. And you know, radiation is often considered as dangerous or it's a, a kind of medium of transmission. So I, I wanted to kind of think about what possibilities you know, we can have with the use of, of sound and, and image. This is an old image of a former radio program inside of Cook County Jail. I just, I showed it to someone the other day and they recognize the font and they think it's from Jet Magazine. I, I haven't verified it, but I, I found the image from a scholar named Melanie Park who's been doing a bunch of work about the history of Cook County Jail. We were teaching inside of, well, different classrooms inside the jail, one of which was an old tier that was turned into a classroom. So, you know, usually this is where people are kept to, to a cell, um, and then there's a kind of common space, and so many of them were being turned into storage or classrooms. And so, basically, the way we organized it is myself and my collaborator went into the jail, pitched it to one of the divisions and said, you know, this is what we're doing, who's interested in signing up, and people self-selected, had a sign-up sheet, and that's how we got the participants for the project. In the workshops that we held, one of which took about 18 weeks, we would meet twice a week for two hours a day. We worked with probably about 30 people. Because it's a jail and not a prison, you might have people that are there for two weeks, so you might have people that are there for many years. And so programmatically, it was difficult to think about a curriculum and a structure, but we managed to sort something out that sort of worked out. But in the workshop, you know, pedagogy is a big part of my practice. I'm, you know, I'm an educator as well, so I had to really think about ways in which to kind of get participants to understand some of the work that we we're trying to do, but also kind of open it up to think about new possibilities and ways that they can contribute ideas. And so it really became more of a collaborative process. So we were always sort of changing and shifting. We did a, a lot of performance exercises. We did readings. We read poetry by Asada Shakur, for example, talked about metaphor and, and symbols. And we looked at the work of Doris Salcedo and, and talked a lot about trauma and interventions. So here's a little clip of what our workshops look like. <laughs> it down on the clock. Loose squares, triangles, circles, trapezoids, fill the void, slowly developing like a fetus. Feed us, Father Mana. We don't understand angelic language till we sit still. What we're going to do now is we're going to break up into small groups. And we're going to start working on the project. You gotta have a balance. You got the good, and then you got the bad. You know, you have like Jordan Four, then you have West Care, like different parts of the digestion, makes different which parts of the machine. Yeah, that's so perfect. Okay, okay. And we came up with what we want to do is something to do with like a checkerboard. We want to do like a timeline, like we want to start start to finish, kind of like how. They so all of you are working separately. What what draw what what connects all of you together then? That it's all structured. Okay. And like. Uh, DOC, uh, M8, the walking in. And the machine digests them through the system almost and gets lost through the system and the belly of the beast, kind of like a catacomb. We're in the city. They don't want it to be a sort of people's eyes, so they put a wall there instead. Good job, guys. Good job, Ali. On the first day of the workshop, I remember one of the, we call the group the ensemble. So one of the ensemble members said, you know, we asked, what do you want to communicate to the public? So we're going to produce a public art piece. And 
one person said, we want to communicate that we're alive and that we're charged. And so that became kind of the mantra for the rest of the project. And I also was really fitting with thinking about radioactive, you know, as a sort of charge. So we developed drawings and audio. We recorded everything inside that tiny room. We made a, a kind of makeshift recording studio, we like to call it, and eventually worked with a sound engineer to make the audio you know, clearer and, and stronger. So here's another little clip of some of the audio that somebody recorded. I should tell you that what we decided is that we wanted to personify the jail itself. So we were looking at the work of ghosts of Avery Gordon, Ghostly Matters, and she talks a lot about the sociology of space. And we were interested in hauntings, and so we started to identify parts, physical parts of the jail that then we can personify. So for example, the scene that you saw earlier in the video with Martin is he was holding, somebody's holding a chuck hole in front of him, which is the hole on a, on a sword del, a, a door cell. <laughs> and um, he's talking through the chuck hole. So his focus was that chuck hole and communication that happens between detainees. In the next piece that you'll hear by Frederick, he decided to create a kind of dark humor piece where he's having a conversation between the bottoms and tops of a DOC uniform. And so that's a little bit about what you'll hear in that piece. So that's just a little excerpt. So one of the things that we talked about is they can't talk about their cases because they're awaiting trial. So we also use fiction as a way to kind of circumvent that. You know, and a lot of them, of course, talked about their experiences, but they did it through, through fictionalized narratives. And so that was also an important element to how we approached the project. So over the last few months, after we developed the work in the fall and then continued with another division in the spring, um, we started to meet up with some of the people that were now out of Cook County Jail. So this is us doing a, a, um, a really cool pose. <laughs> right? It was like a really badass group of people right there. We also started to meet up to look at the drawings that were developed during the program you know, and some of the drawings were developed in the spring. So Ali, for example, who's continued on with the project, he was in the fall session, you know, was able to advise on even the spring material because, you know, he, he was a part of it. And so it was important to get that investment and that participation from the ensemble when they, when they came out. This is Chris, Christopher, who we found out as we were recording that he had a background in radio, actually. He was a radio disc jockey in his 20s. So he was really excited to get back to broadcasting. So he did the voiceover for the public debut. Just a few weeks ago, we were excited to be interviewed by WBZ and Vocalo Radio. So we were able to bring some of the ensemble members in and talk about uh, the experience, talk about the project. And then the project debuted a month ago, and these are just some of the images that, that come from the work. We're working on a larger video documentary, but here are some of the images. This is a piece that was made by Herb, who basically created this sort of apology letter to his family. He never had a chance to really apologize, and this was this opportunity to do so. Other people talked about certain parts of their cell, like the tile or the broken mirror, and created images about that and audio about that. Some of the ensemble members were able to bring family members to the event, which was also like really significant that family members, even though you know they may have certain kinds of tensions with family members due to whatever circumstances they're in, that 
some people actually really came out and to, to support them. That was really important. That's Alex, this is his drawing. Like a really incredible, super talented illustrator and poet. I also invited artist William Estrada, who does the Mobile Street Art Cart, because the piece was mostly kind of getting people to look and listen to the work. It made sense to also invite somebody to get folks to create something tangible that they could take away with them. So people produced posters like Abolish ICE and Abolish Prisons. And then during the debut, we invited the ensemble members to, to do the introduction and to invite people in, to invite them into the project and talk about the experience. This is some of the crew. Now the event took place on two days. At night, we had to get four really high definition projectors. We worked with the video team and audio team to, to make this happen. And and we also teamed up with Lumpen Radio. So Lumpen Radio did the live broadcast. So people were able to tune into the radio station and hear all of the audio content. So we were syncing. It was, it was quite a complex thing to do because we were trying to sync the radio broadcast, which is going through radio waves, and then the video, the images through the video. So I have a little clip that we just, like, we just made yesterday give you a little bit more of a sense of the project. It also took place during the Mexican Day Parade weekend, so it's very lively, as you'll see. They incarcerate the body, but they also incarcerate the mind. They shut the mind down, which I think is not a rehabilitative process. certain is that I have definitely seen it all. Do you see me or do you just look past my pain? I talked about my experience while I was incarcerated and giving people a chance, you know, just letting them see um, what the people on the inside on their day to day on what they grow through and their experiences. It's designed to make you feel like you're nothing. It's really designed to make you feel like you're worthless. The, the most traumatic uh, event in my life would have to be uh, at an early age. When those images were projected onto the wall, I was able to see it in a whole new way. I was able to see inside without actually having to go inside. I was able to see what people are thinking about, what stories they're telling, where they've been, who they are. It's huge. It's a barrier. It's heavy. It's the material is cement. You can really see what's behind the wall. It's something that separates two worlds. The light by me, and worst of worst, when it's dark, comes me. As long as I've been here in Chicago, I've seen schools closing and libraries closing, and all this stuff is closing. But. They put this here, and they keep adding to it and adding to it. This building is continuously growing. Most of all, I wasn't here for my loving mother and my sister. My man took me somewhere that it has, that it was only through the grace of God that I made it back. When I hear the word brother. Yeah, 
yeah, I think I'll end with that, but I'm happy to answer any questions if you have any. Thank you.